Let us pray. Creating God, you knit us together in our mother's wombs. You blew into our nostrils the breath of life. And in your likeness, you nurtured us in knowledge and wisdom. We gather this day with profound thanksgiving and gratitude for graduates who had the privilege to learn, for faculty who had the privilege to teach, for administrators and staff who had the privilege to plan and to organize, for families and friends whose sacrifices brought us to this glorious day, for all those souls you will call us to feed both physically and spiritually. Loving Jesus, walk with our graduates this day and throughout their lives. Remind them that you are their example of how to love the unlovable, to touch the untouchable, and to speak sometimes the unspeakable words in the face of power. Empowering spirit, give assurance to those we celebrate today that even though they will face challenges in the days ahead, you did not give them a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. You, or, you alone ordain their divine calling and your spirit intercedes on their behalf in, with sighs too deep for words. Manifest your spirit in this hour as we sing your praises, receive the preached word, and honor our graduates for their faithfulness to the call of the theological student. All praises and honor to the triune God. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the litany of thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to God for gifts gracefully given. For the gifts of your spirit made manifest in preaching, teaching, music, and study. For love and courage. For wisdom and commitment. For knowledge and discernment. We praise you, God, for all your Jesus. For the church of Jesus Christ. For the call to ministry. And the grace to accept. For the gift of each other, for the love, prayers, and strength of family and friends, for the guidance, challenge, and care of mentors, teachers, and colleagues. We praise you, God, for all your grace, for the continued unfolding of the call, for the repeated affirmation of our baptism, and for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We praise you, O God, for all your great and glorious deeds. You may be seated. It is an honor and a great privilege for me to welcome all of you who are here in person and participating online to this service celebrating the presentation of awards and diplomas to the graduates and students of Perkins School of Theology. My name is Craig Hill, and I have the honor of serving as the Dean of Perkins School of Theology. This morning in Moody Coliseum, here on the campus of Southern Methodist University, the university awarded degrees to the graduates of all academic programs. This afternoon, Perkins School of Theology will present the diplomas that certify those degrees to our graduates. Each school of the university has its own traditions for the presentation of diplomas and awards. Perkins is both a school of the university and a theological school of the United Methodist Church. Our mission as an academic unit is to prepare women and men for faithful leadership in Christian ministry. Therefore, the most authentic way for us to present diplomas is to engage in an act of worship. And so that is what we are here to do this afternoon. The preacher for the service this afternoon is our own Dr. Michael Hahn. Dr. Hahn is concluding his 25th year of service at Perkins School of Theology. 
He has been the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the United Methodist Scholar Teacher of the Year Award, and just this morning awarded by the university faculty, the University Citizens Award. A native Midwesterner, he earned a bachelor's degree in music education at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, and a master in church music and a doctor of music at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Michael has served on or chaired countless committees at Perkins as well as within the wider university. His publications include over 500, 500 scholarly articles, columns, reviews, curricular materials, and books. I'm not sure I have 500 ideas. He has <laughs> Michael has traveled extensively to over 40 country, te uh, countries, teaching, I know, at least from A to Z, from Australia to Zimbabwe. He has been called upon frequently in his capacity as a world authority on music leadership, instruction, and hymnody. Michael believes he can teach anyone to sing, and he has the results to prove it, although the jury is still out with me. He retires this year as the University Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Church Music, I hope you'll join me now in expressing our gratitude to Michael Hahn for being willing to deliver the word of the Lord to us today. Okay. Please be seated. We also wish to recognize another retiring faculty member and senior administrator who served for nearly 20 years as director of the intern program and then associate dean for student affairs, one of the most beloved and admired figures in the Perkins community, Dr. Bill Bryan. I don't believe they're here with us uh, this afternoon, but I'd be remiss if I failed to mention the transition of two other key staff members. The first is our wise and capable Chief Financial Officer, Linda Hervey, who retired in September. The second is the incredibly hardworking and always helpful assistant to the director of the intern program, Judy Gibbons. During this service, we will, of course, be recognizing and celebrating the achievements of our students and graduates but their accomplishments would have been impossible without the support and encouragement of a lot of other people, many of them sitting here today. So I want to invite first those of you who are spouses and partners of our graduates to please stand and remain standing. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you. If you will please, uh, if you'll please remain standing, there are also here children and grandchildren of our graduates. Would you stand, please? <laughs> okay. Now, none of that would have been possible without parents and grandparents. So parents and grandparents, if you would stand. Now, I want all of you who are graduating to thank them. <laughs> thank you, and please be seated again. Following the service today, we will host a reception in the Great Hall of Prothrow Hall uh, just across the way at Perkins. Uh, we hope you'll stay and join us for that reception. And now we come to our time together of worship. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, 
you serve your own interest on your fast day and depress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is this the fast that I choose? A day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and the Lord will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Dean Hill, my distinguished and dear colleagues, and hopeful graduates, and most welcome family and friends, it is a miracle that we're all here. <laughs> I have a feeling if we took just about 30 hours, we could start to hear just how much of a miracle it is. Every fall, for as long as I can remember here at Perkins, I've been privileged to lead worship during orientation week. And even during that brief time, I start to get a little bit of a sense of what it's taken to get to this place. But there's one that sticks out in my mind. It was 2003, I think. I was, at that point, the international student advisor. And we were very excited. The, uh, the committee, along with Tracy Ann Allred, had admitted three students, Methodist students from Liberia. Now, we admit students from Africa all the time, but the difficulty here was they were in a war-torn country, the Civil War. And so uh, right away we realized, uh, after we got the visas and everything else, that our flight arrangements uh, were not going to take place out of Liberia. Somehow we had to make arrangements to leave from another country. And we were on pins and needles for days trying to work that out. I didn't realize later how difficult this was, but to leave a country in civil war over land, cross another country, Cote d'Ivoire, with public transportation, and then go across another border, every border taking probably five, six hours, and finally arrive in Accra, Ghana, and flying out. They came about a week late, as I recall, but it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Some years uh, later, I took 
about one quarter of that journey in an air-conditioned van, and I was exhausted. I cannot imagine what it was like for them. Uh, two of them joined the seminary singers. We all wanted to hear their story, and so we asked them about that in, the, in a singer's rehearsal, and they said, well, it's too much, but we have a song. We've come a long way, Lord, a mighty long way. We've come a long way, Lord, a mighty long way. You took our burdens in the heat of the day. We know our God's going to find a way. We've come a long way, Lord, a mighty long way. And that became our theme song for the time they were here. But you know, I don't really feel connected until I get you to sing. <laughs> we're going to do this till we get it right. <laughs> I'm going to sing a line and I want to hear you sing it right back. We've come a long way, Lord, a mighty long way. our burdens in the heat of the day. I know our God's going to find a way. You took our burdens in the heat of the day. I know our God's going to find a way. Close enough. We've come a long way, Lord. A mighty long way. We've come a long way, Lord. A mighty Better stand and help me out. We've come a long way. We've come a long way. I'm a little nervous about that because in talking to my homiletics colleagues, a sermon can peak too soon. <laughs> I identify strongly with each of you here today. To my colleagues, how privileged I have been to share our vocation together in this place. To the graduates, though we are separated by several decades in age, well, in some cases. <laughs> it's an honor to be graduating together. We have a lot in common. No more grades. No more exams. And we're all wondering what the heck is going to happen next. But to the proud and supportive parents and friends who have nurtured and supported these graduates all along the road, I identify with you too. Having children and grandchildren of my own, it is amazing to watch the next generation grow in faith and identity. I know, however, that you are holding out hope, holding out hope that this may be it. Yes, the time has finally arrived when they may actually be financially self-sufficient. <laughs> and to Dean Craig Hill, I am so grateful that my final year as a faculty member has overlapped with your first year as dean. I've learned a lot and have been well supported by all of the deans with whom I've worked at Perkins, but I think I speak for this community that we are grateful for your call to Perkins, your vision for ministry in this place. And if I'm not mistaken, you seem to be developing a bit of an affection for this school. <laughs> its heritage, its mission, 
And I can assure you that our affection for you as well uh, and the gifts that you and Robin bring is heartfelt. Uh, you've demonstrated extremely great wisdom during this first year other than your choice of preacher for today's event. <laughs> but amidst any celebration, there's also pain. Last week, one of our students died. I offer these words of gratitude and hope and assurance for the life and witness of Deborah Yannico Rogers and for all of us. My life flows on in endless song Above us lamentation I hear the real though far off hymn that hails a new creation. Above the tumult and the strife, I hear that music ring in. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? What though my joys and comforts die, I know the Savior liveth. What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night God giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love now reigns over heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing. I would imagine that all who speak at commencement events hope that they can leave some words of wisdom, little gems of truth, but we all labor under the impression that we might actually be remembered for something. So I've tried to come up with an idea that I think you remember. So here's my idea. In line with my sermon title, Do You Have a Song? I propose to take the handheld microphone and wander among the faculty, students, and our honored friends and family members, and offer you the opportunity to sing a few bars of your favorite song for all of us. Now keep in mind, this is a live webcast going around the world. <laughs> but what a great opportunity. Perkins got talent. <laughs> I have no restriction on musical genre, gospel songs, stately hymn, rap, Elvis, Beyonce. Only that it come from your heart and that it be short so we can really include as many as possible. Just joking. <laughs> as memorable as that might be, I've decided not to do this. I have a couple of faculty colleagues who would hog the whole time. And, uh, as much as I love to sing, the sermon is actually not about singing. Let me put it in the words of one of my mentors. He said, the question for the Christian is not, do you have a voice? The question for the Christian is, do you have a song? To expand on the song metaphor, what you have been doing for the last few years is developing your song. United Methodist Bishop and Perkins alumnus, Paula Martinez, put it like this in Perkins Chapel service back in 1996. Each generation must, must add its stanza to the great hymn of the church. Each generation must add its stanza to the great hymn of the church. The church needs your song and your stanza desperately. Since you will be adding your stanza to a great hymn that began centuries before, you need to know the songs of the saints as well. Your song will continue the unbroken chorus that began when the morning stars sang together. But the stanza you will add will not sound like any other that has gone before you. It will broaden the soundscape of the church's worship and ministry. It will represent a worldwide vision of a church where the global south provides much and even most of the creative energy. It will be a song that resonates beyond our sanctuaries and must find life in the streets. Our three scripture passages offer insight about the content of your song. Permit me a little musical terminology, that's all I really know. Philippians 2, the great kenosis hymn, the hymn of self-emptying. 
This could be understand as a song that is the basis of all songs, and we have a word for that, a term for that in music, the cantus firmus, the cantus firmus. Now I can give you a very elaborate musicological definition of the Latin term cantus firmus, or I can just tell you what it means. <laughs> the cantus firmus is that melody that is so important and well known that it ties all the other parts of the song together. In other words, without the cantus firmus, the entire composition falls apart. The cantus firmus of our vocational song is about the incarnate one who was born in a specific place for all places, a particular time for all time, and of an identifiable ethnicity for all cultures. A song of humility and a word that craves celebrity. Learn this song very well. It's going to take you a lifetime to sing it in tune. The passage from Isaiah 58 forms a counterpoint to Philippians 2, reminding us that not all of our songs will be sweet tunes with immediate appeal. Sometimes you will be called upon to expose false worship and heresy. One should not confuse the good news with saccharine platitudes and promises. Then there was the Psalter lesson, a particular rendition of Psalm 23, one of the most familiar passages of Scripture. But this reminds us that part of your vocation is sometimes to sing a very old song in a new way so that the world that has become a bit jaded and a bit hard of hearing discovers its wisdom and relevance again. I have to go with what I know, and that is music making. So whether you sing another note in your life, and I certainly hope you do, aspects of the musical process may be very helpful and informative to your ministry. Let me tell you a story. I led music in a really great downtown Raleigh, North Carolina church in the mid-1980s and early 90s, before I came to Perkins, and the choir had a long history of singing the finest music of the Western tradition. I came to the first rehearsal, however, and discovered one major problem. They really sang loud all the time, too loudly, and they didn't listen to each other. There were 30 faithful people in the same choir loft who more or less started and stopped together, but otherwise, they seemed to have little concept of a choral community. Each vied to be heard above all the others. For any choir to be skilled in the choral arts, the singers need to be able to listen and sing at the same time. Uh, it may take a little practice. In this case, it took about three years. That's the way it works in my business. <laughs> the application, though, is painfully obvious. Don't try to yell above the chaos and the strong voices of your congregation. If you want to shape the body of Christ, it's going to take as much or more listening than talking. Another thing I learned about music making came from six months of teaching in a seminary in Nigeria in 1989. I took the place of a furloughed missionary offering church music courses and leading worship. One of my tasks was to play the piano five mornings a week at the 8 a.m. required chapel service. We haven't instituted that yet here. <laughs> they had an upright American-made piano that, let's just say, was not adapting well to the tropical climate. The piano contributed more cacophony than concord to worship. The piano was so bad, and some of you have been waiting for this, that you would have prayed for an accordion. <laughs> Gratefully, an energetic, five-part West African drum ensemble played on all the hymns and drowned out the sounds of this wretched instrument. Those drums could even bring energy and vibrancy to the most doleful Victorian hymn. Each morning it seemed like there was a new drum ensemble. I began taking lessons on the Yoruba talking drum from one of my, my students in my class, a very fascinating way not just to learn a new instrument but a new way of musical thinking and also gain insight into Yoruba culture. So as we were concluding the session one day, I asked my drum teacher a question that, given my Western training, really made a lot of sense, quite logical. So I said, so, whom do you think is the best drummer in seminary? He looked at me, kind of strange, and didn't say anything. And I realized that I had done it again. I asked a stupid question in a vastly different cultural context that made absolutely no sense. After some time, he gently revised my question. 
I, I think you mean to say, Professor, which is the best drum ensemble? You see, an individual drummer is nothing without a good ensemble. Once again, I think the lesson is apparent. You will be called the congregations used to having a soloist. The big mistake is you fall into the trap of becoming a solo act. This is not easy to avoid these days. Indeed, many in your congregation may expect you to be the soloist. My friends, the church doesn't need more soloists, but needs leaders who recognize the gifts in others that they may not see in themselves. Rather than being the soloist, I suggest you look for opportunities to be the lead drummer in the ensemble. Um, when you hear and see a West African drum ensemble, you really can't tell at first who's in charge, who the lead drummer is, because the ensemble is so cohesive. But the lead drummer has an essential role. The lead drummer is the one that assures that the underlying pulse is steady. The lead drummer introduces subtle creative variations that invite a response by the other drummers in the ensemble. The lead drummer assures that the ensemble maintains a seamless texture of continuity. The role of the lead drummer is to work from within the ensemble, not to play drum solos. Always having to be the soloist is a sure path to burnout and disillusionment. Furthermore, celebrity stars run the risk of building cults. Lead drummers know how to work within the ensemble and build the community of Christ. There's one more thing that I've learned about music making from the church and other places in the world. A great characteristic of song is that it is portable. You can sing any place. One of the most important aspects of sharing your song is the need to take it beyond the hallowed halls in the sanctuary so that it can sanctify the streets. Friends, you know as well as I do these days that people who need the good news are not necessarily going to come into our beautiful places of worship. In fact, many have become inured to the delivery systems of the past and purposely avoid coming into the church building. Gratefully, we are aware that the body of Christ does not depend upon a building, right? Just checking. <laughs> I remember specifically when I got a glimpse of the power of song in the street. I was a seminary professor in a small North Carolina town in 1986. Its location was barely an hour from, the Greens, from Greensboro, where on February 1st, 1960, the Greensboro Four, as they were later called, began a new movement of peaceful demonstrations. Four black freshmen at North Carolina A&T University initiated pacifist activities, including sitting in restaurants unofficially designated for whites, drinking at uh, posted white-only public water fountains and moving beyond the back of the public buses. Though removed by over 25 years from these events of 1960, I was aware that in the little town I was living in there were racial tensions that remained just under the surface. Vestiges of decades of racism were visible in the inadequate housing conditions and public services available to the African Americans. The segregation of blacks from whites literally across the railroad tracks from each other further deepened this cultural chasm. Given this history, I was particularly disturbed by an announcement that the state leader of the Ku Klux Klan had requested and was granted a permit to hold a demonstration down the main street of this small town of 6,000 residents. I joined my seminary colleagues in concern about the effects that a KKK rally might have on our community a community that needed healing rather than a public display of racism. As a result, many of us encouraged the seminary students to join us along the parade route in a silent protest against the KKK. Well, the day of the march came, actually right about this time of the year. Well in advance, the main street was lined with many representatives from the seminary as well as townsfolk. In addition, I recognized some clergy colleagues from nearby Raleigh, people who had experience marching in civil rights demonstrations in the 60s and 70s, some even with Martin Luther King Jr. At the appointed hour, a military-style procession slowly made its way down the street to a drum cadence. 
The participants were dressed in army-style fatigues and carried rifles. I prayed that they were not loaded. Riding in a lone jeep was a North Carolina state leader of the KKK surrounded by his honor guard. Having grown up in Iowa, a state with a relatively homogeneous racial population in the northern Midwest, I had never experienced anything like this. I was paralyzed by what I saw. I sensed the presence of evil more strongly than at any previous point in my life. I watched in disbelief and silence as local high school students ran out to join this macabre parade, chanting racist slogans in support of the stated principles of the KKK. The seminary students were angered by this, and they attempted to restrain the teenagers, leading to struggles between the two groups. It looked as if a brawl might ensue, providing the possibility for publicity and deepening the long-established racial rifts that already plagued that community. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. A retired Baptist minister from Raleigh, known for his long uh, work with civil rights movement and public stance against the war in Vietnam, he whispered to me, Mike, help me sing. I thought he was crazy. I have no experience in these kind of events, and I, I felt like I was in some kind of theater watching something in slow motion. I was a voice teacher, but I couldn't get any sound to come out. Then I heard that minister start to sing with a voice full of the conviction and confidence of many peaceful demonstrations. We shall overcome. Though he was not a vocal soloist by anyone's imagination, the sound was one of the most beautiful I've ever heard. He helped me and those close by to find our voices and our song grew. Our ill-conceived strategy of silence in the face of evil gave way to a full-bodied song. As the malicious procession passed, we found not only our voice, but we found our feet, and we spontaneously closed ranks behind this demonstration, ushering the KKK band out of town on the wings of our song. Somehow, the incipient struggles between the students and the local teenagers subsided almost immediately, and the sound of song replaced racial epithets. Reflecting later on the experience with students, some noted that our singing not only demonstrated an overt support for African Americans in our community, but also functioned like a musical exorcism, taking back our town. What might have happened if that Baptist minister hadn't started singing this venerable song of the Civil Rights Movement? Friends, your ministry needs portability. Memorize it. Your song needs feet, it needs wings. Take your song to the streets, learn it by heart. You never know when you need it. I can tell you from experience, silence leads to paralysis. Singing leads to solidarity. Yeah.
seated. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I hope um, your choice of Philippians 2 means I doesn't preclude me from using it in the future. Absolute favorite text. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we come to the portion of the service now where we have an opportunity to present awards to current students and to members of the graduating class. Some of these awards are granted by organizations outside the school, some by faculty, and some by members of the graduating class themselves. The first award, the Dr. and Mrs. J.P. Bray Award in Hebrew, is given to the student who ranks highest in Hebrew scholarship. The recipient this year is Ian Lang. It was a surprise. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. The Charles C. Selectman Award in New Testament Greek is given to the student who ranks highest in New Testament Greek scholarship. The recipient this year, James Powell. The Charlie T. and Jesse James Bible Awards are awarded to students on the basis of academic achievement in biblical courses and overall scholastic performance. There are four awardees. Emily Robnett, Matthew Bell, Matthew Bell, Christopher Keller, and Clint Bordelon. Congratulations. 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 The WBJ Martin Award in Homiletics is given in recognition of the most outstanding student in the introductory preaching classes. The recipient is Michael Geinger. The W.B. Degenerate Award in Homiletics is given to the senior student with the highest academic average in courses in homiletics. This year's recipient is Kathy Nations. <laughs> Kathy here? Perhaps not. Okay. She's coming? Oh, good. So we could pick someone else, but all right. <laughs> Congratulations. The Paul W. Quillian Award in homiletics goes to student who's presented the best written sermon. This year's recipient is Brian Phillips. The William K. McElvaney Preaching Award is given to a student who has presented the best written sermon on a public issue, which includes a social crisis, a controversial issue, 
or a chronic social problem. Uh, this year's award is granted in absentia to Morgan Stafford. The Robert Weatherford Prize for Internship Preaching was established to honor the distinguished service of Robert Weatherford for the United, to the United Methodist Foundation. This award is given to the Master of Divinity students for excellence in preaching during their internship. There are two recipients of the award, Joshua Lemons and Emily Robnett. The Bert Affleck Award is given to a student for creativity in ministry during their internship. The recipient this year, Dina Hamilton. <laughs> it's a long walk, but it's worth it. So. The Jerry W. Hobbs Award in Worship was established in memory of United Methodist layman Jerry Hobbs. It's awarded to a student who has demonstrated academic excellence in worship combined with personal commitment to the worship life of the Perkins community. The recipient this year is Sung Moon Lee. The Fellowship Seminarian Award, established by the Fellowship of United Methodists in Music and Worship Arts, is given to a graduating seminary student who displays outstanding leadership in music and or worship arts, including but not limited to dance, drama, fabric art, and liturgical writing. The recipient this year is Simon Hill. The Jane Marshall Award for Outstanding Scholarship and Leadership in Christian Worship. Funded by a gift from Jane and Albert Marshall, this award is given to a Master of Divinity or Master of Theological Studies student who's demonstrated excellence in the study and practice of Christian liturgy and worship. This year's recipient is Frederick Burns. The Hoyt Hickman Award for Outstanding Liturgical Scholarship and Practice is awarded by the Order of St. Luke to the graduating student who has demonstrated quality scholarship in the study of liturgy and is an effective leader of Christian worship. This year's recipient is Heather Goddess. Thank <laughs> you.
Congratulations. Thank you. You get all of this. <laughs> the Master of Sacred Music Award is given to the senior MSM student who ranks highest in scholarship and service to the community. This year's recipient, Joshua Zentner Barrett. Again, congratulations. <laughs> the Roger Desher Prize in Sacred Music was established in memory of Roger Desher, a longtime professor of sacred music here at Perkins. The prize is given to continuing MSM students who excel in academic work, musical ability, and overall achievement. This year's recipient is Richard Walsh. The Albert C. Outler Award in Theology is awarded to the student contributing the most outstanding essays in theology during the academic year. The award is given in absentia this year to Mark Graffin Reed. The Philip Schaff Prize in Church History was established by Klaus Penzel, is awarded to students who have demonstrated excellence in the historical study of Christianity while participating in courses in church history. It is named after the founder of the American Society of Church History. This year's recipient is Matthew Esquivel. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> The Karis Stahl Fadeli Award is presented to students who exhibit the qualities which are, were exemplified by Karis Fadeli. Commitment to Jesus Christ and the total ministry and mission of the church, responsibility in assigned tasks, ability to excel in a wide range of ministerial functions, and use and management of time. There are two recipients this year, Russell Legrone and Nicole Melke. Brith Award in Social Ethics is given by the Howard or the Harold M. Kaufman Memorial Foundation to students on the basis of scholarly competence in the field of social ethics and to personal commitment as shown in voluntary activity in support of worthy causes. The award is presented this year as in former years by Sandy Kaufman representing the Harold M. Kaufman Foundation. The two recipients of the award this year are Nicole Melke and Hannah Sutton. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The Harry Hoosier Spirit Award is our newest award, established by Perkins alumnus, Reverend Dr. Henry Masters. The award is given to a graduating student who best exemplifies the spirit of Harry Hoosier, 
expressed in what was described as his, quote, elocution of faith. I sing by faith, preach by faith, pray by faith, and do everything by faith. This year's recipient, recipient is Brian Phelps. Our final award. The Doctor of Mrs. Glenn Flynn Senior Award is given to that member of the graduating class who, in the judgment of the faculty, best exemplifies the aims of the school and the church for its ministry. There are two recipients this year, Katie Lewis and Paviel Jenkins. <laughs> oh, and you, uh, and oh, Katie, yeah, you get this, and one for you. Don't worry, you're all going to get something here in just a moment. <laughs> Indeed, we now turn to that climactic portion of the service in which we present diplomas to the members of our graduating class. For the Master of Arts in Ministry degree, Alexandria Grace Burkett, magna cum laude. William Carlisle. Emily Catherine Eubanks, summa cum laude. Aaron Sloan Jackson, magna cum laude. Nicole Boutros Melki, summa cum laude. For the Master of Sacred Music degree, Simon Christopher Hill, summa cum laude. <laughs> Ronnie Chase Wilson. Joshua Zintner Barrett, summa cum laude. Yeah. 
for the Master of Theological Studies degree, Donna Lynn Baker, magna cum laude. LaShonda Callahan. <laughs> Nancy Eileen Kramer, summa cum laude. Matthew G. Esquivel, summa cum laude. Matthew Santana Gonzalez, summa cum laude. Chuo N. Lang, summa cum laude. <laughs> Rodney Arnes Petty, with a concentration in urban ministry. James Lee Powell, summa cum laude. <laughs> Naomi Bewe Nyandwa Singabuila with a concentration in pastoral care. Katie Marie Starks, cum laude. Roy Garrett Atwood, magna cum laude. This is for the Master of Divinity degree. Uh, the next graduate, Jessica Juanita Aziz, summa cum laude, with a concentration in Hispanic studies. George G.K. Barol, with a concentration in urban ministry. Matthew Ryan Bell, magna cum laude.
Clint Joel Bordelon, summa cum laude. Sadie Elizabeth Brink, magna cum laude. Johnny Taylor Brinson. <laughs> Joyce Teresa Brooks. Dylan Selby Burns, summa cum laude. <laughs> Frederick Clifford Burns III, summa cum laude. Carl Philip Carlson, summa cum laude. <laughs> Jennifer Chickering, magna cum laude. Catherine Herman Kerbo. <laughs> James Michael Decker, summa cum laude. Forrest M. Davini. <laughs> Joy Woodland Dister. Jacob Wesley Fields. <laughs> Sina Danielle Gans. Michael Ryan Ganger, summa cum laude. <laughs> Stephen Goldsmith.
Robert Charles Goodson, magna cum laude, with a concentration in pastoral care. Heather Leanne Gottes. Yeah. Callie Ellen Green, magna cum laude. Dina Marie Hamilton. <laughs> J. Allen Henderson, summa cum laude. Sarah Jean Incom, cum laude. <laughs> Allison Grace Jean, summa cum laude. Margaret Jenkins. <laughs> Paviel Chris Jenkins, summa cum laude. Carrie Amanda Jones. Christopher Allen Keller, summa cum laude. Thomas Kellner. <laughs> Russell Warren Lagron, summa cum laude. Sung Moon Lee, cum laude. <laughs> Joshua Mackenzie Lemons, cum laude. Katie Lynn Lewis, summa cum laude.
Stephen Eric Lohefer. Patricia Marie Lund, summa cum laude with a concentration in pastoral care. <laughs> Joshua Elijah Manning. Eric Andrew Markinson, summa cum laude with a concentration in pastoral care. Mary Montgomery Mears, magna cum laude. Heather Moore. <laughs> Dallin K. Morgan, cum laude. Kathy Thompson Nations, summa cum laude. <laughs> Ailza Harl Odom. Miguel Angel Padilla. <laughs> Jordan Thomas Perky, cum laude. Bryant Xavier Phelps. Kenan Wayne Pickett. <laughs> Colin Cave Powell, magna cum laude. Amanda Rose Price. <laughs> David Eli Rangel with a concentration in Hispanic studies.
Myron Eugene Rhodes, Jr. Emily Lauren Robnett, summa cum laude. Kelly L. Sanford. Courtney Rose Schultz, summa cum laude. Johnny Simpson. Stephanie McKellar Staten, cum laude. <laughs> Courtney Lynn Webb, summa cum laude with concentrations in pastoral care and urban ministry. Cassidy Jean Wolfarth. For the Doctor of Ministry degree, Cynthia Cole with honors on the D-Men project. Charity Charonda Star with honors on the Demon Project. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Perkins School of Theology 2017 graduating class.
the spoken benediction, I invite you to be seated so that the faculty and the graduates can lead the way out. And following uh, the conclusion of the postlude, I invite you uh, to be our guest in the Prothrow Great Hall. If you're not sure where that is, it's just over that way, but they'll tell you where it is. Receive this blessing. May the God who created all of our songs and Jesus Christ, the cantus firmus of our song, and the Holy Spirit that's going to keep us singing that song through all eternity be with each of you. Go in peace. Mein Hachose Klavor, Elek Hamid, Uvachol Makom Shelek, Eftach Halon, Halon Shelor, Vazrazi.